Good morning and God bless you. It's an honour and a privilege to come into your homes this morning and to welcome everyone to church this morning. We're going to worship, we're going to hear an amazing message and we're going to be inspired by our almighty God. Amen. So if you are able, why don't you stand this morning? We're going to lift up our hearts, we're going to lift up our minds, we're going to lift up our souls and our spirits. The almighty God who loves us, who knows us, who is for us and who is with us. Amen. So whatever your circumstances this week, this is the time to stand within his presence, to honour him with your praises, and to receive everything that he has for you. Amen. So he is an everlasting God and we're going to praise him in this house today. Amen. Yes. Amen. Good morning, everybody. How are you all? To see some smiling faces in the house, only the right number. We're very careful, but it's good to see some people here this morning. It's good to look out at smiling faces, so it's really wonderful. This morning, um, I'm going to continue. You know that we've been going through the book of Ephesians, and uh, we're now up to the last part of chapter 3. And so the next part of chapter 3, you will remember that when we started in Ephesians, it, Ephesians is, is split into two parts, chapters 1 to 3. Um, talk about who we are in Christ. Chapters 4 to 6 talk about how we are to live the life that God calls us to. So we are now coming to the last part of the first part, of the first half, the end of chapter 3, who you are in Christ. And in fact, chapter 4 begins by saying, let's live lives worthy of the calling. So you can immediately see a shift of focus where Paul is bringing this letter Chapters 1 to 3, this is who you are in Christ, and then chapter 4 begins now. Let's live lives worthy of this. And so what Paul is doing here in the first three chapters, he's actually, in, well, in my mind, he's laying a foundation for what he's about to talk about. The first half of Ephesians is really a foundational thing for us to understand who we are in Christ because once we go to chapters 4 to 6, to live that out, he's talking about the life we are to live out. To live that out, really, we need to have taken hold of one to three. So we need to get this, and now we're coming to the end of chapter three. So let's see, what does Paul have to say when you think about it? What does he have to say for the last part of this, which is so important for us to get before we begin to understand the life that we are to live out? And in fact, you'll remember Paul started this letter in Ephesians by praying for the church to be enlightened about how amazing salvation is. He says, I pray that your hearts would be enlightened, that you would truly understand the glorious riches of salvation, the emphatic language that he uses, the strong language that he uses. It's, it's so important to him for us to not be left in any doubt. You can't misinterpret it. You can't misinterpret the kind of language that Paul uses. He uses strong words. He speaks of every spiritual blessing, not just some spiritual blessings. Those who are in Christ Jesus have every spiritual blessing. You will remember when Jim was teaching us in chapter 1, you'll remember these words, blessed, loved, chosen, adopted, favoured, words that we cannot miss, how God strong love that he has for us. And also at the start, Paul talked about power and inheritance and authority. So he's really, really wanting to bring a strong understanding to the church. This is who you are in Christ. He's got a calling and a purpose for our lives, but we need to have a foundational understanding. This is who you are in Christ. We will live out that call when we know who we are. And as I said, he uses really emphatic language. It's like, get this stuff, people. Get this. Understand this. It's so important. In fact, it takes up half the book. Telling us who we are in Christ takes up half the book. That tells us how important it is for us to have this as a really strong revelation in our lives. So as we've been going through Ephesians, we're coming to the end of chapter 3. So we're going to go to verse 14 because that's where we've come up to. And um, it says this, When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of heaven and earth. So just in this part, Paul brings a description of God in two ways. He is the Father and he is the creator of heaven and earth. 
There'll be more about that later. So let's keep reading verse 16. It says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. This is such a powerful statement. Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Now, this came as quite a revelation to me. This came as something that was a real eye-opener to me. See, there are things of God that we cannot understand. I think we would all agree there are things of God that we cannot understand. We're learning and we're growing and getting to know God all the time. But there are things that are too powerful for our human minds to understand, that are too, they're really too big for our human finite minds to understand. Isaiah 55 says that his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Um, 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that at this point in time, we can only see in part. At this point in time, we can only see certain things. There are some things we actually cannot see at this point in time. So there are things that are really too great for us to understand, things of God. But what I found is when I decide to trust God, meaning when I purposefully give something over to him, and I say purposefully because that means I have to make a solid decision, I will not worry, I will not stress, I will not fret. Because if we say I'm giving this over to God, but then we continue to worry, what it actually means is we've still kept it as our own because we're still carrying the burden. What happens is worry and stress and all that, that comes with the things that burden us. So if we say, God, I'm trusting you in this situation, I'm giving this to you, but then I'm still worrying, I'm still fretting, I'm still stressed, it means that burden is still sitting on me and I haven't actually given it to him. So when we say that we trust God, it means that we are taking a burden that has been sitting on us and we're handing it to him. And it is a purposeful thing. Uh, Letting go of our burdens doesn't come automatically. We have to make a decision. This has been stressing me. This has been worrying me. I can't see the answer to this situation. God, I'm going to give it to you. And that's why I say purposefully. When we give it to God, we purposefully, we make a decision, that's it, I'm not worrying about it anymore. I'm not stressing about it anymore because I no longer am carrying that burden. In Matthew 11, the Bible says, come to Jesus if you are weary and heavy laden. Heavy laden means if you're carrying some sort of burdens, if you're carrying burdens, come to Jesus and he says, give it to me because I carry the heavy burdens. I'm the one that will carry the heavy burden. And we've been singing songs this morning about how God makes a way. So when we trust God, even in things that we cannot see a way, even in things we cannot see an answer, we say, God, I'm handing that to you. It's a decision then to draw a line. That's it. I'm not worrying about this anymore. It belongs to God. It no longer belongs to me. It actually doesn't belong to me. I've given it to him. I've given it to him. I don't own this anymore. I don't own this stress. I don't own this worry. I don't own this fear. I've given it over to God. And as we come through, we're going to see that there's a lot better things to take hold of and hold as our own. It's like an exchange that can happen. God, I'm going to give you that. This is what I'm going to take hold of and make this my own. And here's what I found. When I do that, if I say to God, I trust you in this, and I put my trust absolutely in him, and I determine that I will not worry and I will not try to take that back, when I give something to him and I put my trust in him, I have found that I somehow know him more. He becomes so real in my life, so much more real because I've trusted him. And this scripture where Paul says, Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. It's like the more we trust him, the more he just comes and he dwells and you know that you can trust him. You know that you can be at peace. And I found that my knowledge of God, his realness, it goes to a new level. My sense of who God is in my life, who God is for me, it goes to a new level because I've given him my burdens. I've just trusted him. Lord, I just trust you. It doesn't mean some knowledge is grown. There's just something I have come to know God better. 
in that place of resolved trust, I find him in ways that I've never found him before. When I've resolved that my trust is in him, I have found things in God that I never, ever have found in any other place. If you want to know God more, trust him with something that you've never trusted him with before. Or trust him in a way that you've never trusted him before if you want to know him more. Trust him with something that you've never trusted him with before. So what can we take from God? If we give him our burden, what do we get to take hold of and hold? Well, here Paul goes on to speak of God's love. Verse 18 we're up to. This is about how we can experience the love of God. How do we experience the love of God? Well, verse 18 says, May you have the power to understand as all God's people should. In other words, this should be something we're all taking hold of. All God's people should. May you have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide, how long, how high and how deep his love is. Paul has these You need to get this moment in his letters. Um, Sometimes when I read Paul's letters, that's the way I can only think of to put it. It's like, you need to get this. And he says, may you have the power to understand as all God's people should. In other words, you're a person of God, you need to get this. You need to understand this. You need to take hold of this. And he says here, may you have the power to understand May you have the power to understand. Now, that expression, power to understand, the word understand there is the Greek word katalambano. My apologies to people who can actually pronounce Greek. That was my attempt. And it means to take eagerly, to seize, or to possess as your own. And he's saying, may you have the power to katalambano. May you have the power to take hold of, to seize, to possess as your own how wide, how deep, how high and how long God's love is for you. See, we hand God the burden. What does he give in return? He gives us his love. And Paul says, may you have the power to understand it, to take it as your own. See, it's one thing to hear about something. It's one thing for me to stand here and say to you, God loves you. You can go, oh, that's nice. It's one thing to hear it from somebody. It's one thing to give it a thought. But it's another thing altogether to take hold of it, possess it as your own. God's amazing love belongs to me. This belongs to me. I remember when I was a teenager in the church that we were, where I was going and uh, Pastor Jim had just become a Christian and had joined the church And I'll never forget this. One day I was sitting somewhere and I saw your Bible and Jim had put a little sticker on his Bible and it said, Jesus, and it said, I'm his, he's mine. You know, I've never forgotten that. I was like, I'm his and he's mine. We need to take the love of God and say, this is mine. This is mine. Jesus, you can take this burden. I trust you with this. I trust you with my life. And then that love of God, that belongs to me. I've got the love. Verse 19, he says, May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. As I said, there are things of God, they're too great for us to understand. But here's the thing, you can experience the love of Christ even if you can't fully understand it, which means, like, I love my husband, I love my children, I love my friends. I know what that love is. But there is a love in God that we can experience and it is beyond our understanding. It is so amazing, it is beyond what we can completely understand. Well, we can experience, so it can be part of our lives. I can possess it as my own, but it doesn't mean I can fully understand it because it is bigger and greater than the love that I understand that I have in this world for the people in my life. May you experience God's love. That word experience, again, the original Greek word is gnosko, and it means to know absolutely, to be resolved and to be sure. 
So God's love, we can have it that we know it absolutely. We are resolved in it. We are sure we absolutely know this great love that God has, it's mine. Now, it's speaking of appropriation. Appropriation means that when something is someone else's, but we take it to be our own. And when God loves us, like I said, we can hear about it. That doesn't necessarily do a lot for us because circumstances can very quickly push away just what we hear about or just what we have a little thought about. But we can take hold of God's love to a point where no circumstance in our life can shift that love. We can experience God's love to a point where no matter what happens, nothing will ever shake me from knowing God absolutely loves me. Now, you think about it. If you give him your burden and say, I trust you with that, and then you have that absolute knowing that he loves you, you don't need to even try and take that back because God absolutely loves me. Nothing will ever shift God's love away from me. It's the appropriation. This is mine. This belongs to me. In Romans 8, if you remember, if you've read in Romans 8, again, it's Paul, one of his letters, obviously, to the church in Rome. And Paul speaks of how there is nothing in the heavenlies or on earth that can separate you from God's love. There's nothing in the heavenlies nothing in the heavenly realm, the realm that we yet don't fully understand. There's a realm we yet, we don't entirely get it yet because we are living on the earth, right? But Jesus said, you are in this world, but you're not of it. So there is this realm that we have some interaction with, of course. We don't fully understand the heavenly realm. But in both the heavenly realm and on earth, the realm where we are living and we know this realm, there is nothing either on earth or in the heavenly realm that can separate us from God's love. There is nothing, either on earth or in the heavenlies, this absolute love is mine and nothing can separate it. Now, remember I said earlier that Paul is about to go into the part of the letter where he starts to actually talk about how we live this life, how we live when we know who we are in Christ. So now he is laying a very strong foundation. And the foundation is the unshakable knowing who you are in Christ, how much loved you are by God. And it gives us that confidence, it gives us that strength to live out the life. You remember in verses 14 and 15 that we just read that bit earlier, Paul started this by describing God in two ways. He is our Father and he is the creator of heaven and earth. It's like he's saying, I'm about to tell you how loved you are by God and in case you don't get who it is, who loves you this much, he's the creator of heaven and earth. In case you haven't taken hold of how great and how powerful it is who gives you this salvation which changes everything, he's the creator of heaven and earth. And in case you're thinking, how could I possibly approach him personally? How could I possibly approach him in a way that is How can I confidently come to him? How could I possibly approach him personally? Well, he also says, he's your father and he's a good father. How does a child approach a really good father? Confidently and without any concern and it's very personal. He's the creator of heaven and earth and yet he knows every hair on your head. He's the creator of heaven and earth and yet every day of your life has been written in his book even before one of them came to be. He is our good, good father. And he uses words like how wide, how long, how high, how deep. Why use that phraseology? How wide, how long, how high, how deep? To make the statement that this love is bigger, this love is greater than anything else. There isn't anything in your world. There is no sin. There is no shame. There is no disappointment. There is no regret, there is no hurt, there is no whatever that is greater than the love of God. It's like Paul is saying, let's get hold of this love, let's get healed, let's get forgiven and forgiving so we can go and live the life that God has called us to live. Let's put our baggage away. This love is greater than your baggage. If your baggage is sin, this love is greater. If your baggage is shame, this love is greater. 
If your baggage is disappointment, if your baggage is hurt, if you're, I'm not trivialising baggage, I'm just saying how wide, how long, how high, how deep means this is bigger, this is greater. There is no baggage that this love cannot heal. It cannot heal and it cannot deal. It can deal with whatever. So whatever is holding you back, whatever is holding you down, the love of God, when you experience it, it is greater and it is able to heal all these things. Nothing is too big, too serious, too old, too new, too unique, too whatever that the love of God can't heal and bring wholeness so that we can walk through into what he has for us if we take hold of it. We have to decide, I'm going to take this for me. This is not just going to be a side thought. This is not just something I learnt in Sunday school. This is not just something I hear the preacher saying from the pulpit on Sunday. This is not just something my mummy says to me. I take hold of this. This love is mine. It belongs to me. And that love is strong enough to heal everything. This is the stuff that transforms our lives when we take hold of the power of God's love. And what Paul describes here is the foundation for transformation. You'll remember that um, in Romans 12 it says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to live out God's will for you. It's the same sort of thing. Once you know who you are in Christ, in other words, once your mind has got it, once you know who you truly, you truly know who you are in Christ, then you'll be able to walk in his will. Then you'll be able to work out his will for your life, and you will be able to walk in it. Why does the mind have to be renewed? Because it is the engine room of our lives. Our mind is the engine room of our lives. When this is renewed, when God renews our minds, once this here is renewed, it will lead us to live the transformed life. It will lead us to live the life that God has purposed for us to live. When this is just full of baggage, it leads us to more baggage. It just, whatever our mind is full of is the direction our life will go. And that's why the Bible says, be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. We need to allow God to renew our mind. What we fill our minds with is the direction our life will travel on. We carry so much in here that we should be giving over to Jesus so often. He invites us to. So why do we just carry it? We carry so much baggage in our minds and Jesus invites us to give it to him so he can renew our minds and we need to take hold of his great love. The how-to of a transformed life takes place here. When we, when we are born again, when we ask Jesus to be the saviour of our life, our spirit, it comes alive. Our spirit is brought alive. Our spirit is good to go. But then there is the thing we have to take hold of that he can renew our minds. If we take hold of his word, we allow him to transform every single part of our lives. When you connect yourself to God as his word and his word, when you take hold of the power of his love, when you trust him fully, God can begin to do like a paradigm shift in your mind to renew us. Now, for anyone who doesn't know what a paradigm shift is, it just means it's a shift of our perspective, it's a shift of all our underlying assumptions. We all have underlying assumptions about everything in life. And when we allow God's word to take hold of our lives, we take hold of the love of God. When we begin to trust him, we begin to know him, we begin to draw closer to him. When all that is going on in our lives, God is doing a paradigm shift and he's dealing with our underlying assumptions that keep us away from him. And drawing, he draws us closer to him. And I love that Paul ends this chapter about knowing who we are in Christ, again with such a strong statement, once again really emphatic strong words so that you don't miss it, so that you can't go, I don't really know what he means there. It's so plain, it's so clear. Verse 20, he says, All glory to God who is able through his mighty power to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. This is Paul. We, you know, we use this verse sometimes when we pray because it's such a powerful verse. What is Paul actually talking about? He's talking about who you are in Christ, 
who you are in Christ, being transformed, living the life that God has called you to. And one of the words he uses, exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think. This is why we need to have our minds renewed because we cannot think enough of what God has for us. It's so much. And then he ends this chapter by saying, glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask the people that are here with me now to stand. Thank you. And I'll just, I'm going to pray for some people this morning. And obviously we can't all be together. Some of you are watching um, in your home. Hopefully you might be with some people or whatever. I just want to pray for some people. And as Jim said before, there is no distance, there is no space where God is concerned. So if you pray with me, you don't have to be here. You can be where you are. And we're in agreement and the Holy Spirit is working. So I'm going to pray for a couple of people this morning. I want to pray for those people who don't know Jesus as their saviour, but you want to receive Jesus as your saviour. We're going to pray a prayer of receiving Jesus as saviour and we're going to all pray it together so that no one's praying it by themselves. But I want to invite you at home, if Jesus is not your saviour and you would like to ask him into your life so that he can do that work in your life, the exceedingly abundantly above what you can ask or think, above the life you have been living so that you can receive him as your saviour, I'm going to invite you to pray that prayer with us. I'm also going to pray for people who are struggling in any area, particularly if you're struggling with your sense of whether God loves you. If you're carrying burdens that you shouldn't be carrying, I'm going to pray with you so that we can push those burdens off. We can say, God, I'm going to trust you with that. I'm handing that to you. I'm giving that over to you and I won't be taking it back. And instead, I'm going to take hold of the experience and the fullness of God's love for my life. So if that's you, I'm just going to invite you to pray with me now. So if the people here in the building with me, if you would pray the sinner's prayer through with me. Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I invite you to be my saviour. Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe you rose again. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. And I ask you to be my Lord and Saviour. I thank you that you have come into my life today. And from this day I live for you. In the powerful name of Jesus, amen, amen. If you've prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to connect with us about it and we'll sort of help you uh, to move forward from today. Also, I'm going to pray now for those people who just need that touch of God in their lives. Maybe you need God to just, just remind you how loved you truly are. If you're struggling with that or if you're carrying burdens you shouldn't carry, let's pray. If that's you, just Wherever you are, just raise your hand to the Lord because if you're in agreement, then you are praying with us wherever you are. Heavenly Father, I lift up those people, Lord, who just need an absolute revelation of your love. I pray that there will be by the Holy Spirit such an experience of God's love over people, particularly over the minds of people in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for minds that um, are bound up with old things or bound up with hurts or whatever, and we break that in the name of Jesus. And I speak the power of God's love to come over people right now in the name of Jesus. Anyone who's, who's asking you, Lord, anyone who is seeking out to you, I pray, Lord, you touch them now in the name of Jesus. Touch minds, touch lives. In Jesus' name, Lord, I speak over the burdens that are being carried, burdens that don't belong to us, burdens that you have invited us to give to you. Today, Lord, we accept that invitation. We give you our burdens in the name of Jesus. We will stop worrying. We will stop fretting. We will stop stressing. And we declare we trust you completely, Heavenly Father. We trust you because you are our God. And you are a good Father. You are a good God. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for praying with me, those who are here and those who are at home. If you prayed 
um, just want to invite you to connect with us. Uh, if you want to send us an email, info at riversidecc.org.au or just pop onto our website and you can be in contact with us. You'll see how you can be in contact with us there. We are starting a uh, alpha course and it's exploring life, faith and meaning. And uh, you can do that right at home on Zoom and it's a, a time of just discovery. If you don't have any idea what Christian faith is about, this is exactly for you because this will help you understand you know, the, how God sent his son to die for you and why he sent his son for you. If you don't have an idea of your purpose in life, then this is exactly for you. And you can respond at info at riversidecc.org.au and we will connect up and you will just have a fantastic time. Also, we have uh, different groups that meet online. We have connect groups. And uh, again, you can do that the same way. We have uh, fantastic groups, different age groups, different experiences. So connect with us online. And also, uh, we will continue praying. Pray that this COVID thing will be completely gone. So pray at 7 o'clock every night. Just a quick prayer. It doesn't have to be too heavy. God, remove this thing from our nations, nations of the world, and be with our our leaders of our countries to get us through this. And then finally, we just want to thank you for those who give faithfully. You can do that online by direct deposit using a uh, straight into the account or you can use a debit card or a credit card and there's a Tidely app that you can download if you wish. Thank you very much to all those who are faithfully giving. You're an incredible blessing and we appreciate your support. And you can connect with us online at riversidecc.org.au, on our Facebook page and also on YouTube channel if you want to watch the message again or if you've missed a message, some great inspirational uh, messages there for you this morning. So fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, this morning it is a privilege to invite for us Pastor Pavey and she is going to bring an inspiring word. So would you welcome her this morning? Everyone's here. Fantastic. Wow, the church is overflowing. We have a total of 20 people in the church. The house is full. How funny is that? It's almost like too much, too many people. So great to have everyone with us this morning.